The following workshop is presented by National Educational Consultant, Dr. Jawanza Kunjufu. Are you going to accept Mrs. Jones' offer to be in honor classes? <laughs> Are you kidding? I can see it right now. All of my friends talking about me and calling me a nerd. I know the feeling. They still call me stuck up because of the grades I get and the way I talk. That's why I dropped out of honors classes. I think it's harder on the brothers myself. <laughs> if you can't fight, play ball, or get high, you're just not with it. Well, I'm not trying to compare, but sisters are vicious. <laughs> Listen, why don't we cut ninth period geometry? You want to go to the park? Word, let's get out of here right now. All right, let's go. I'm a consultant across the country in a program titled Closing the Gap, the gap between white and black students. Uh, the average white European child in our California tests is scoring at the 60th percentile. The average black African American child is scoring at the 30th percentile. Now, we believe there are five major reasons for this gap. One reason has to deal with teacher expectations. There are many teachers who lower expectations for black students. Another reason for this gap lies in parental involvement. There are some parents that are not involved and supportive of their children's education. Another reason has to deal with student self-esteem. There are many children that do not feel good about themselves, that do not like the way they look. Another reason for this gap lies in the curriculum. It's not motivating. It's not relevant. And also learning style. Children learn in different ways. And many teachers give left brain lesson plans for large numbers of right brain thinking students. But the major reason, or one of the reasons we're going to look at today for this gap lies in peer pressure. There are five major reasons for this gap. Teacher expectations, parental involvement, student self-esteem, the curriculum, and peer pressure. And we wanted you to be with us today because we want to look at the impact of peer pressure on academic achievement. What we're getting at is that it's very possible for parents to be doing their job, for teachers to be doing their job, and it all go for naught because the black peer group is more concerned about what kind of gym shoes or sneakers they wear, what kind of clothes they wear, how well they dance, fight, and play basketball. Is there anyone in this audience that has had a negative encounter with peer pressure, a situation where your peer group was not reinforcing academic achievement? Can anyone give some example of how their peer group was not encouraging them to do a good job in school? Anyone? Yeah. Judy? Um, I have an incident like... In our class, we have free bells. It's like a study hall. And some people who have study hall will ask other students who drive to school, like instead of studying for a test, to take them somewhere to get something to eat or whatever. Okay. And if they say no, then they'll say, well, you're a nerd for staying to study. You, should, you don't have to study. You mean, study tomorrow when you get home, or you know. And again, the person there at the study hall had the car. Uh -huh. And they were trying to get that person to leave study and go get them something to eat? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have an example where negative peer pressure um, did not reinforce academic achievement? Anyone else? An example like that? Where your friends uh, did not encourage you to do a good job in school? Anyone else? With a situation where your peers did not reinforce academic achievement? I have some peers that they do, but then they don't, so they don't reinforce academic achievement. Well, that's because you have some that do and some that some don't. Some that do and some that don't. But Describe don't those really, that don't. They don't really, it's not that they tell you don't go to school or something like that, but I have people who say, well, why don't you come over my house? And then we'll do so and so and so and so. And I'm like, well, I have to go to class because I have already missed so many days out of class. And it's like, well, you can miss one more day. It's, no, I can't. So I, I go to school anyway. But, and then some, you should really come to class because you miss it out on so much. Okay, and a little later on we're going to talk about which way do you side with those that reinforce or those that don't. In my latest book titled To Be Popular or Smart, we also interview students across the country, those that had good friends and those that had bad friends. And I just want to share with you an excerpt from one of the brothers named Lamont, who was one of the ones influenced by the negative peer group. This is what Lamont had to say. I can get an A on any test I want. It doesn't matter whether it's biology, algebra, English, history, drafting, or gym. In some of my classes, there have been five tests, and I've gotten five different grades. I've gotten A, B, C, D, and F. It's hard being serious the entire year. I've got too many distractions to be in honors classes, 
But I remember one of my partners to tease me and call me a fag. I usually sit in the back of the class and clown. And sometimes I don't go to class at all. I'm tight with my friends and the women love me. I don't see the guys respecting the nerds or the women chasing after them. I would like to get A's or B's. It would really get my parents off my back. But I can't be serious for 40 straight weeks. Plus, I'd rather be down with my partners. Has anybody experienced something like that? Where you've got an A, a B, a C, a D, and an F? In other words, you can train it on when you want to train it on. You can turn it off when you want to turn it off. But many of us have a real difficult time being serious the entire year. And we have to work on that. I want to uh, look at some questions. I want to ask this group, how do you act white? See, there's a rumor going around Cincinnati. There's a rumor going around that when black youth are doing a good job in school, they get teased. When the brothers are doing a good job in school, they're called a chump or a nerd or a fag. And I've even heard in some cases that when black youth are doing a good job in school, mm, you're acting white. Now that's deep. If being smart is acting white, what does being black mean? I now want to first of all ask this group, how do you act white? And then we'll go into how do you act black? How do you act white? Well, from my experience, a lot of people talk, that I've talked to say that, you know, I may act white or whatever because of the way that I speak because um, I don't use a lot of slang a lot of times unless I'm just joking around. And when I want to get something done or be assertive or serious, I speak, you know, proper English. Or it might be the way that you act or the way that you carry yourself. A lot of so when you speak uh, proper English, they say you're acting white? Yes. Okay, and what else are you saying you're saying when you act a certain kind of way? How do you act a certain way that causes people to call you acting white? You're not uh, like using slang or you know walking a certain way or doing certain things that the stereotypical black person would do. Then you're acting white. Okay. And remember, if we know what acting white is, we have to also know what acting black is. How do you act black? If acting white is speaking proper English and walking a certain kind of way, how do you act black? Does anyone know how to act black? Okay, anything else? Have you heard that comment that uh, to be smart is to act white? Okay, so when you act black, what does that mean? I mean, if, if acting smart is acting white, then how does that relate to grades for acting black? Is that right? I guess, yeah. That's what it's saying. If you're, if you're smart, you must be white. If you're black, then you must be dumb. Because white people say we don't know anything anyway. Okay. And what is a nerd? Does anybody know what a nerd is? I understand that we don't want to be called a nerd. I mean, that's the worst thing to ever be called. What is a nerd? Well, he's always in their books. He's always worried about getting their grades and getting A's and has a less um, social life. Now, would acting like a nerd make you popular with your students, with your friends? Your other, your other nerdy friends, but oh, not, your other nerdy <laughs> friends, right? okay. not, not the in crowd, not the people who are popular and are worried about how their hair looks or what's happening at the football game. You could the be in crowd is into what the the, the hair, the how your hair looks. Social life and the nerd, the nerdy people are more into their books and trying to achieve something for themselves. And in most schools, are there more nerds or more people in the in crowd? More people in the in crowd. In the in crowd. Okay. Okay, and we need to work on that. Uh, I want to now ask, which group, or in terms of uh, Asians, why do Asian Americans uh, do a very good job in school? Why do Asian Americans do a very good job in school? They constantly study. Okay, so they study uh, more. To reinforce your point, Kevin, on the SAT, uh, the, the average Asian on the SAT is scoring 920. And the average white European student is scoring 908. And the average black African American student is only scoring 700. Now, you gave one reason for this gap, and that is the average Asian studies 12 hours a week. The average white student studies 8 hours a week. And we only study 5 hours a week and watch more TV than anybody else in America. Any other reasons why Asians do a very good job in school? Well, their parents um, kind of emphasize schoolwork a lot. Okay, so their parents reinforce academic achievement, and you think that sometimes their parents may reinforce achieving more than African American parents? Okay, don't worry. Uh, I know that's not the case with your parents. 
Uh, but let's go on to the second part of the question. Why do African Americans do such a good job in sports? In the NBA, 86% of the NBA basketball starters are black, except in Boston. But only 1% of the engineers and doctors in this country are black. Why is it that black students, black people, do a better job in sports and music than they do in other areas? Is it ability? What is it? They concentrate more on sports and, like, just saying, like, in school, since they were young, their peer pressure influenced them to, you know, go with the in crowd and sports and dance, so therefore they emphasize that more. So okay. now when they get older, they still emphasize that. Okay, so you're saying the black in crowd is enforcing the sports and music, and the Asian in crowd is reinforcing the study? Okay. Yes, yeah, Charlotte? You spoke about expectations. If someone expects that you are naturally inclined in this area, that's sort of where you get groomed. Okay. And if someone naturally expects that you are not academically sound, then you will be groomed away from that. So you're saying when they don't see our students in the school, uh, and they see an Asian student, they automatically assume this person may be well-versed academically. And when they see a blind student, this person may be well-versed in sports and music. Okay, so we have to work on the issue of expectations. And that's a serious issue that we have to look at. We want to also look at some characteristics of lower achievers and higher achievers. And I just want to find out, do some of these things apply to you? We want to look at the underachievers, those students that were not doing well in school. And these are some of the things that they did. And I want to find out, do you do some of those things? The underachievers, remember, these students are very smart. They just don't want to do well. They, they're very smart, they just do not want to do well. Some of them cut class. Do you, I'll, I'll make it even easier. We won't say you. Do you know any of your friends who are pretty good in school in terms of ability, but sometimes cut class? Do you know anyone like that? Okay. We, we also notice that some of them don't even attend class at all. I mean, they miss school altogether. I mean, they left home. Their parents think they went to school, but they never showed up for division. Anyone you know that's acted like that? What about sitting in the back of the class? Do you know any of your friends that sit in the back of the class? I'm going to make this more at home. Do any of us sit in the back of the class? Okay, okay. We've also noticed that some of the underachievers don't ask questions. That it's not cool to ask questions. Do you know anyone that sits in the back of the class and doesn't ask questions? Do you ask questions? Or do you sit in the back of the class? Which one do you do? You do? In the front of the class or the back of the class? In the middle, okay, you're in the middle, okay. We've also noticed some of the underachievers, they take easy courses. In schools where you only have to take maybe one hour class in math or two in science, once they get finished with that, they don't take any more. They do not take trig, they do not take calculus or college algebra. Do you know anyone who takes easy courses in high school? Do you all take easy courses in high school? You all taking all the courses, all the way, four years of math, four years of science? Okay, let's go on. This group also doesn't believe in studying. Okay, they are afraid their peer group is going to call them a nerd. Do you know anyone like that? That also wants to avoid studying? And then lastly, this group does not want to be called a nerd, a brainiac, an Oreo. What's an Oreo? What is an Oreo? A person who's black on the outside but is white on the inside. Black on the outside but white on the inside. Now, elaborate. I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? You're, you're black, you know, <laughs> you're black, but on the inside you perceive yourself as being white. You do your work and you hang around a lot of white people and you act white. Okay, and remember this group surely would not want to be called an Oreo. And last but not least, this group uh, does not speak standard English. They would never go to a museum and they always listen to black music. They don't listen to classical music or anything else. They have to listen to a certain kind of music. Now that's the underachievers, but we also have some higher achievers. Is there anyone in this audience who's a higher achiever? Higher achiever. They can tell their peer group no. If you can tell your peer group no, raise your hands. Okay, now we will find out right now if you fit into the higher achiever category. <laughs> now, this group though also wants to be part of the in crowd. In other words, they decided, I'm going to find a way to be smart and still be part of the in crowd. Some of the things they've done is become an athlete. William, as you well know, you can still be a damn brother if you can also play basketball. So you're okay if you're on the honor roll, if you also, I mean, you can okay in terms of playing basketball if you're also on the honor roll. So you can do both. 
or the class clown. Does anyone in the audience know how to be the class clown? I mean, you get A's in school, but you tell good jokes. And because you tell good jokes, then you're part of the crowd. Is there anyone in this audience who knows how to be the class clown? Okay, you all tell good jokes? Good jokes, okay. Another one is they're never caught studying in public. I mean, they get good grades, but no one never sees them studying. Anybody fall into that category? Well, you study, you fall in that category? So you get good grades, but no one knows how you got them, right? So you study by yourself. Or another one is they're very independent. How many of you are independent? I mean, you're strong, you feel good about yourselves, you're independent, very good. Also, some people that have done well in this situation are good fighters. In other words, they're able to tell their peer group, if you don't like what I'm doing, we can go down. Now, your first name, the green is? Right here, you're right. Oh, yeah. Your first name? Ruben. Ruben. Now, have you noticed that, that if you can fight, you can also be accepted by your peer group? Because yeah. many brothers don't respect how well you can do academically, but they do respect how well you can fight. Is that right? Okay. Uh, some other ones that we heard were the uh, better students, they also tutor the bullies. In other words, you can be accepted by your peer group if you tutor the bullies. And then the last one that we saw was they act raceless. Like you just mentioned about acting like an Oreo. They are black, they are white. They try to walk a fine line in the middle. And it's real hard to look black and then act white, quote unquote, so your black friends don't like you and your white friends don't like you. That's called being raceless. And that's real hard, where your black friends don't like you and your white friends don't like you and you end up raceless. I know what you're going through. I'm, I'm also in this book as well. I was a ninth grader in high school, and I was in honors classes. And my friends teased me so much, I flunked the whole marking period intentionally, trying to get kicked out of school or out of honors classes. Had not been for my father who then kicked my butt, I'd had some real serious problems. But the compromise was I got a chance to run track and be involved in martial arts. My friends liked that, running track and being involved in martial arts. But it's real tough dealing with the peer group, and we have to work on that. But what I want to now do is to look at black excellence. You see, I was real concerned about if you thought that being white was being smart, then that means that being black is being what? Okay, and I won't, put, I won't even put dumb on the board. Uh, that's embarrassing. But my, I have a real concern with if being white is being smart, then what does being black mean? You see, before 1954, we didn't act this way. Being black meant, used to being, the, meant uh, being the best. And we need to redefine again what it means to be black. See, I'm from the old school. See, I was taught that Hippocrates was not the first doctor, that the first doctor's name was M. Hotep. What I'm getting at is, whether we're talking about science, in, er in every area that we've been allowed to participate in, we've always been the best. All we've ever needed was the opportunity. So in science, was M. Hotep, or Granville Woods, or Louis Latimer, or George Washington Carver, or Walter Massey, or Sister Jemison, our first black female astronaut, you name the area. All we've ever needed was the opportunity. We're talking about black excellence, because it used to be being black meant being the best. If it's in business, we have strong men and women there as well. Reginald Lewis, who now owns um, a large company that he just acquired, or John Johnson at Ebony Magazine, or Ed Gardner at Soft Sheen. All we've ever needed was the opportunity. In writing, can you all name me a very good writer? Rather than me just giving you all the names. Can you name me a black writer that you think is very, very good? Yes. Nikki Giovanni. Nikki Giovanni. Any others? Richard Wright. Richard Wright, Tony Morrison, Alice Walker, Gwendolyn Brooks, Alex Haley. In education, Carter G. Woodson, Benjamin Mays, and Mary Petrell, the current president of education. Strong black men and women. In television, who has the best show on television right now? Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby, and the best newscaster in terms of the talk shows, there's two. One the, well, actually, they're both in the morning. Who are they? Morning talk show hosts. Brian, Brian. Brian Gumbel, and who's the other one? The female. Oprah. And Oprah Winfrey. Winfrey. You name the area, we've been good at it. What about in the movies? Who has the greatest box office attraction in the movies? Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. And then you add on people beside Eddie Murphy, Cicely Tyson, and Jones, and Lou Gossett. You name the area, we've been good at it. Let's move the music. Name some top stars in music. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Who else? Anita Baker. Anita Baker. Luther Vandross. Stevie Wonder. Aretha Franklin. What about sports? Who's the best uh, basketball player? Michael Jordan. 
Who has rushed for more yards in football in the history of the sport? Rushed for more yards. Just retired from Chicago. Oh, oh Walter, Payton. Walter Payton. Okay. And uh, who had more home runs than anybody in baseball, including more than Babe Ruth? Initials H.A. Hank Aaron. Okay. So again, you name the area, we've been good at it. Nor are we lazy. Think about it. The rumor is we're lazy. If we're lazy, why did they bring us to work America? If we were lazy, they could have kept using their servants. We are the world's greatest workers. We're not lazy. In addition to that, we raise their children. We're good at nurturing as well. Also, who received the Nobel Peace Prize? And he lives in South Africa, Zania, right now. Matter of fact, one is living, one died. The Nobel Peace Prize. One lived in America, one lived in South Africa. One is dead, one is alive. Nobel Peace Prize. The one in America was? Martin Luther King. And who's the other one? He lives in South Africa right now. Bishop Tutu. Okay? So again, and also, who received more votes with less money? He didn't win, but he had the best run campaign, Jesse Jackson. What I'm getting at is, whatever the area is, science, business, writing, music, TV, movies, you name the area, all we've ever needed was the opportunity. All we've ever needed was the opportunity. What, you want to, what I want you to understand is, to be black means to be the best. When you go to your schools with white and Asian students, you represent the race. You represent M. Hotep. You represent Marcus Garvey. You represent King Akhenaten. You represent Nikki Giovanni. You represent Bill Cosby. To be black means to be the best. And we have to work on this. We have to work on redefining what it means to be black. But, because many of us have this kind of definition, now we have to find ways to deprogram it. We have to deprogram our students right now. See, on a plantation, Abraham Lincoln figured out you have 300 slaves, you have one master. That's a lot of work to watch that many slaves. Why don't you let them go? But don't teach them who they are. Don't give them their story. Notice the word his story. That's all history is. Don't give them their story. Don't make them feel good about themselves. Then you won't have to watch it. They will even say in 1988, 89, 90, 91, they will even say to be white is to be smart. To be black is to be what? To be dumb. That's what will happen when you brainwash students. So we have to work on this. And so since this happened between 1619 and 1865, what we're going to do in about five minutes, we're going to find ways to deprogram our students. We want to deprogram about 200 years of brainwashing. But remember, the first step is you need to know who you are. You are an African-American people. Your history did not begin in 1619. It began four million years ago. And when you start talking about good hair and pretty eyes, your hair is good hair and your eyes are pretty eyes. You are beautiful just the way you are. But let's go on in this deprogramming process. There are only four ways to achieve your success and or your failure. When you do well in school or when you do poorly in school, there are only four ways to attribute it. You can attribute it to your ability. You can attribute it to effort. You can attribute it to luck. And you can attribute it to the nature of the task. It was either easy or hard. Now understand, students, what we're going through. Anything you do in life, your success or your failure, you will attribute it to either one of these areas, to your ability, to effort, to luck, or the nature of the task. For example, if you think you're good in math, if you got 100 on a math test, you would probably say, I'm good in math. And that's why I got 100. And if you got a 40 on the math test, you would probably say, I didn't study hard enough. You would never question your ability because you believe you're good in math. So if you got 100, you attribute it to your ability. If you got a 40, you probably say, I didn't work hard enough, which means the next time you take a test, you will study harder. But if you feel I'm not good in math, I'm not good in science, if you got 100 on a test, you'll probably say, it was luck. Or you would say, it, well, it was easy. And if you got a 40 on the math test, you would probably say, well, I never was good in math. What happens is, when you do not feel good about yourself, you won't work harder the next time because you attribute the bad grade to your ability. I want you to ask yourself in all your subjects, 
Do you attribute your success to the ability? Or do you attribute it to luck and how easy the test was? I want you to attribute your success to your ability. And if you do a bad job, if you did not do well on a particular test, attribute it to effort. My sister tried four times to pass the CPA exam, and she did not pass. But she never questioned her ability. She always believed she didn't try hard enough. It's a real good feeling when you never give up on yourself, when you always believe in yourself. You see, many of us are afraid to try. We give up because we doubt our ability. It's called a psychology of performance. And I want you from this point on to work on attributing your success to your ability and your failure to effort. I want you to always stay at level one and two. When you're not doing a good job, you always drop down to three and four. Well, I did good on the test because there was luck or the test was easy. I wish we had time to go around the room and ask you, where do you attribute your success? Where do you attribute your, your failure? Your success, the ability. Your failure, the effort. Never question your ability. Always believe you didn't work hard enough. Another model we want to give to you is called the box. Those things that are for you and those things that are not for you. See, to be part of the in crowd, a lot of times they put you in boxes. When I went to Illinois State, my friends told me that debate was not for me. They told me that running track was for me. See, I, was, I had a track scholarship, and it was blind. I was part of the in crowd to run track. My friends liked that. But when I chose to debate, they said that was not for me. The blind students don't do that. I want to now ask this group some questions with regards to what things are for them and what things are not for them. Being a freshman at a black college, is that for you or not for you? Do you envision that, going to a black college? Could that be for you or not for you? What about playing rap music? What about being editor of the yearbook? The winner of a spelling contest? Gang bang. For you. you said for you. Okay, you nod, Jamie. Be honest. Be honest on television. Score 21 or better on ACT. Kind of weak on that. Is that for you or not for you? I mean, do you, do you envision that you could score uh, 21 or 23 on the ACT? See, in order to do anything, you have to see it first. You have to see it before you can be it. Or what about 1,200 on the SAT? Is that for you or not for you? What about getting high? Not for you. Sure, we got a dead audience today. All the nerds are here today. What about being a member of the National Honor Society? For you. Judy? For you. you sure? What about playing basketball? For you. What about uh, getting pregnant? Not for you. You sure are now, but aren't you? Not for you? <laughs> At least not right now, right? What about a, a D grade point average? Not for you. You sure? What about driving a taxi when you're 25 years of age? Not for you. You sure? What about working at McDonald's at 25 years of age? Not for you. Being an engineer? Yeah. For you? Okay. What about selling drugs? Not for you. Hey, big money selling drugs. You sure that's not for you? What about being a teacher? For you. For you? I like the way your eyes sparkle. We need more teachers. We're losing a lot of good black teachers. Uh, on welfare? Not for you. You sure? Yeah. Owning your own business? For you. Okay, very good group. We have to work on this because what we've noticed is many of the, uh, of the peer group, they want to put you in boxes. Those things that are for you, those things that are not for you. Can you imagine if I had listened to my friends back in 1970 and chosen not to debate, I wouldn't be here today. My public career as a speaker probably began when I became a debater. But my friends said, that's acting white. They thought that running track was acting black. They thought that debating was acting white. We have to really work on this. Those things that are for you, those things that are not for you. And you know what's interesting? There's this theory called a crab theory. A theory that says many of us try to pull somebody down. See, there's only two ways to be somebody. Either uplift yourself, which requires work, or tear somebody else down, which requires talk. 
What's interesting is the in crowd, they don't pull down the athlete, but they pull down the scholar. See, if they were jealous, they should also be jealous of the athlete too. But maybe the real issue is because they believe that black people can do this. That's okay. But with someone like you all do a good job in academics, shows they too could do a good job. And they don't want anyone to know that black folks can also do well academically. So they pull this group down. If the cram theory was legitimate, both groups should be pulled down. But most peer groups pull down the scholar, not the athlete. They praise the athlete. They don't praise the scholar. We have to work on that. But let's spread this around. Beyond the issue of students and the issue of deprogramming, I want to also move to the parents. We want to look at some ideas from the parents as well. Because many parents also have children that may be affected by peer pressure. First of all, I believe that good parents know who their children's friends are. Secondly, good parents invite their children's friends over to get to know them better. And many times, they program their child's peer group to make sure they run with the right group. My parents made so sure I didn't run into a gang in Chicago. They enrolled me on a track team. I had to run cross country, indoor track, outdoor track. Had me running around a track rather than running around a street. First of all, good parents know who their children's friends are. They invite them over to get to know them better. And third, they program their child's peer group. Are there any parents in the audience that want to share some experiences they've had where their children have also had some encounters with peer pressure? Any comments from the parents? I've had some, some experiences where the children have had negative peer pressure. But it's been sort of difficult. I sometimes always like to use Bill Cosby's TV show as examples of some things that parents can do. Because if you step in too far and too hard, then your, your children will certainly go in the direction of that negative peer pressure. So you sort of have to just sit back, be aware of it, and watch it and see if it really is dangerous or not. Sometimes we perceive, perceive it as being dangerous when it really isn't. Okay. So you're recommending parents need to be sensitive yeah. and, um, and stay close. Stay close. Okay. And keep the lines of communication open. If, if possible. Okay. Yes, yeah, Charlotte? I think it also helps not only parents to know who their friends are, but to know the parents of those friends so that oh, you're exactly. all communicating. So you're saying not only know who your children's friends are, but also know their parents. That's very good. Uh, personally feel like when I send him to you, you have the same values that I have. Okay. And so we know we are reinforcing one another when your child comes to me or my child comes to you. Now, young people, how would you feel if your mother, you said you wanted to go over someone's house, and your mother said, well, let me call, you know, his or her parents and talk to them. How do you feel about that? Oh, mama, why you got to do all this? How do you all feel about that when the parents want your friend's phone numbers to talk to their parents to see if everything's on up and up? How do you feel about that? Yes. I think it's unnecessary because I think that your parents should trust you and trust that you will not go out and find bad kids. I guess you call them bad kids because I personally hate it for my mother to do that. Is that right? Yes. Child, what do you think about that? We have, a, we have a young person here that says she thinks it's unnecessary. You should trust me. Okay. Well, I, I sort of have a situation where I knew all the boys, the proud boys, and they were all good guys as far as I was concerned. But, yeah, they sort of got steered off into the wrong direction. Um, I don't know who in the group, you know, might have thought, well, hey, let's try this. Some of the other guys are doing it. But basically, good kids can get themselves into an awful lot of trouble. And then we look back and look at the damage. You know? Especially when they just hanging out. What do you feel about this? If you say you're going over to Teresa's house, do you feel it's okay for you to at least leave the phone number uh, for Teresa? And is it okay for your parents, if they want to, to verify that you really are over Teresa's house? Well, is that okay? Yes, I guess. It's just, I guess. Yes, it? it's okay, but it's, I think it's, well, I'm a kid, but I think it's bad for parents to, you know, like, well, question you about, well, are you really going over to Teresa's house? Well, here, give me your telephone number just so I can find out that you're really going okay. over. Why would I lie? Yeah, mm -hmm. true. So, so you feel because of your integrity that you should be trusted, okay? And, of course, that's okay as long as every time you say you, you're going to do something, you did it. 
Now, you do agree, when you do not tell the truth, then trust becomes limited, right? Okay. For, so, for example, if at some point I really did call Teresa and you weren't there, you would not expect me to trust you the next time, right? You'd have to earn the trust over again. You okay with that? The trust has to be earned? Okay. Okay. Yes. I think sometimes, I think the older you get, your parents should let you go. Because some people are just like too tied to their kids. And I think at a certain point in your life, you have to let go. It's just like when you go away to college. You're going to be calling down there every day what you're doing, who your friends are, who's in your room with you. What do you think that age should be then? I think it should be about 16, 17, something around there. Because 18, you're considered an adult. So you can do what you want to do. But you don't think it should be 18? Well, no. I think you should, should start, it should, you shouldn't start you should. calling your friend's parent. I mean, you're 17 years old. You're practically grown. Right. You have, so you have. I don't think you should be calling your your friends, I mean, your kids' parents and asking them, well, what's so-and-so over there and so-and-so over there? And just like I had a friend who was going somewhere he wasn't supposed to be going. He ended up in a car accident. You know, that's his fault. He should have went where he was supposed to be going. He should have got back. But see, I think it depends on how strong your family, you know, how strong your family is. If they tell you, if they've been teaching you since you've been young to do, and if I say you can't do it and you do it anyway and you mess up, then that's I'm your Diane. fault. And then, Femi? One situation that happens a lot of times with children, not that, I mean to comment on her, not that you don't trust the child, it's just that you want to be sure that since this child lives at home with his parent, that it's okay with his parent to have this child come over. So therefore, when we call to check, we're not calling to check to say, is so-and-so at the house. We're calling to say, so-and-so have your permission to have a crash. Then a lot of times you will find that you trust the children. And the children, if they're going to do something that you are not in accord with them doing, they will have so-and-so being their friend answer that phone. And therefore, you will be talking to so-and-so's big sister or somebody and thinking you're talking to the person. person giving you permission, the child can still get around mm -hmm. doing what they're supposed to be doing if they're trying to get around it. I think the key, though, is, is that um, knowing who the friends are and the communication with the parents is something that should happen when the children are very young. So it becomes a ritual and everybody understands that this is what's going to happen. By the time the child is 16, 17, and 18 years old, hopefully that foundation of expectations on both ends has already been set. And then the trust could then begin to build even more at that point. True. And reinforce that point. You know, a lot of times what good parents also do is they have to check back every so often. You know, there's nothing worse than a child going out at Saturday at 1 o'clock in the summertime, and you don't see them until 9 or 10 o'clock. I mean, all kind of things can happen. So good parents say, why don't you check back around 3 o'clock? and then check back at 5 o'clock, and then at 7 o'clock, and then at 9 o'clock. We're not saying you still can't get involved in negativity, but you only had two hours to do it before you had to check back and, you know, check in again. So that's important, because many of our youth simply hang out too much. But beyond the issue of uh, this, this one, I also want parents to begin to ask their students about what it means to be black. The session we just went through, we want all the parents to ask their students, what does it mean to be black, and what does it mean to be white? See, a lot of times, this could be going on right inside your house, and you didn't even know. You didn't know that your children had this negative image of being black and this very positive image of being white. We want all parents to have a dialogue with their students about what it means to be black. And we also want you to begin to teach more black history in your homes. And not just black history, a new term, black future, black present. Many of our youth are talking about the old greats, way back when. Are there any contemporary black men and women that are also doing something well? Teach, teach that also in your house as well. But to put you all back together, I now want to ask the students and the adults, what is a friend? Young people first. What is a friend? Someone who you can, re who can, you can rely on and who is trustworthy and who respects you. Okay, so a friend is someone trustworthy and dependable, and you can rely on. A true friend. Yeah. A true friend. Wait, 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 wait. Now we get these code words, true friend. Okay, I just said friend. You mean you can have some other kind of friends? Yes. Okay, so let's use your, your, your vernacular. We have true friends. What other kind of friends do, can you have? You have acquaintances. Acquaintances, okay. Or you can have just social people that you hang around, you know. So like associates? Right. Okay. 
Okay. What's an associate, Coyle? Person that you just with when you ain't got nobody else to be with. Okay. So they're not, they're not really your friend, but someone you can sort of hang with when there's no one else to hang with? Okay, yeah. A friend is someone who will accept you for who you are, and not for what you do, what you wear, or, you know, who you hang with. A friend is someone who accepts you no matter if you're not in the in crowd. So you can depend on them, they're reliable, and it's unconditional. Let me ask you this. Would a true friend do something negative to you? No, Would a true friend encourage you? Not intentionally. Not intentionally. Would a true friend encourage you to do something negative? No. Would a true friend gossip about you? No, no. I want you to ask yourself, do you really have a friend? Okay. Because some of the people that have steered you some negative directions, they are not your friends. They are not your friends. If you have someone who encouraged you to cut class, is that your friend? If you had someone that wanted you to steal something from a store, is that your friend? I believe some of you be have had some people that you really did call your friends who really did encourage you to cut class. Don't lie to me on television. You've had some friends that you call friends that encourage you to cut class. And I even believe some of you might encourage them to cut glass. I won't say this one. Even I think some of us have also been involved in stealing from time to time too. We have some people that say they're friends that encourage us to do this. And you have to watch that. Because they are not, they are not your friends. Now I want to ask you, uh, for people that, that, that encourage you to do negative, why would you still want to be with them? And if it's harder talking about you, We'll talk about other people. Why do you think some people have people that they call friends who encourage them to do this? Because they want to be part of the in crowd. They still they want to be able to fit in. Okay. So typical situation of the in crowd. You have nine people. You have five people that are being negative. You have three people being positive. Now it's your vote. Now you have five being negative, three being positive. You have to decide which way you're going to go. Many of us, of course, choose to fall in right here because they outnumber this one. Simple majority, party in crowd. Another one I think I hear a lot of times is my parents, those are my parents' rules. Many young people do not like following their parents' rules. Anybody want to testify on that? Just simply break rules because it's their parents' rules? I just want to be me. And whatever they say, I'm going to do the exact opposite. Have you ever known anyone like that? If my parents say yes, I'm going to say no. If they say 10 o'clock, I'm going to say 11 o'clock. Is that you, Quayley? I'm glad you said I sure didn't want to mention your name, girl. <laughs> Quayley, testify. What, what is it sometimes about, I just don't want to do what they say? What makes you feel good about that sometimes? I don't know. You just don't want to do it because you're sick of hearing it. You're you sick of hearing it? Yeah. Do you think it's, 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 you, do you think about whether it's right or wrong? Okay, it's just, it's just their rule, right? And, and, and you want what, your own? You just want to do what you want to do. You want to do your own, you want to have your own rules? Yeah. Okay. And you're going to do that. Well, you're going to do that. Um, Anybody else like that? You, Judy, testify, um, girl. I feel like, like when Carmen was saying, you get to a certain age, you feel, I'm going to just sing you this year. Next year, I feel like I'll be in college. And like she said, your parents are not going to be there at all times. So it's like, She'll tell you to be here at a certain time, but you feel as though, well, next year, nobody's going to be there to tell you, come and have study, do this, do that. So you feel as though you have to learn on your own, you know, because since no one's going to be there to tell you that, you're going to be like, my mom's not here to tell me, so I can go do it on my own. But if you do it now while you're in high school, you'll learn the hard way. I think it's better for you to learn the hard way than somebody telling you. Okay. And I think it's better to learn while you're in high school than when you get into college and it's too late. Now, Judy, you don't mind learning the hard way? See, your parents love it. <laughs> See, you know, what do parents always say to, this, uh, to, to, that, to that kind of comment? What do they I've say? Been I've, I've been through yeah, it before. I know yeah. going now, on. do you believe they've been through it back yeah, in 1920? Go through what you went through. They've been through it, but you, you, you know, yeah. they, you, should, you have responsibilities. And if they want you not to go through what they, they have gone through, or they want you to go through what they did go through, then they should be able to say, okay, you can learn from your own mistakes, and mm -hmm. you should be able to do this because when you reach a certain age, you should have 
have more responsibilities upon yourself. So you, you feel parents are wrong denying you the opportunity to learn the hard way. I mean, like okay, said, they tell you the first heavy. time. This is heavy. <laughs> not, Y'all don't mind being hurt, right? Not saying I mean, they're really wrong, but saying that you should have, you know, there's only a certain extent yeah. to where your parents can say, you know, you can't do this. And when if you're going to be 18 next year, which is considered an adult age, and right now when you're 17, getting ready to turn 18 or a senior in high school, they're saying they can't stay out past 12, mm -hmm. then, you know, it's kind of, well, you know, especially on prom or something special. Probably they'll do it on prom now. I do. Yes, uh, they, they would. <laughs> Judy, I'm going to say, I think that uh, the youth don't really understand that the parents know the magnitude of the consequences that you might have to suffer. And what parents are trying to do is to protect you from some types of consequences that might be irreversible, like a baby, or like flunking out of school, or drug abuse that that might take three or four years to uh, overcome if you do overcome that. So it's really just more of a protection because you don't understand all the things that might be happening after 12 o'clock midnight and pitfalls that you could fall into that might take the rest of your life to overcome. But how did they find that? They had to find out the hard way. Well, hold on, but the reinforced theory's point, there are 329,000 brothers in prison right now that in many cases were simply hanging out. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And many times the police they don't care who they get. Somebody robs somebody, they just want to find one person that they can just catch very quickly and put them in jail. Thimmy's point about teenage pregnancy. Last year, there were 1.2 million white, black, and brown girls that were pregnant. And you all keep saying, but it ain't going to happen to me. Right? It's not going to happen to you? Not this early? And the same thing with dropout. I mean, we have a national dropout rate of 23%. In most large cities, it's 50%. That's not going to happen to you either, right? You all got it all under control. Like Theo, I got it under control. <laughs> Everything is always under control. Okay, Judy? Uh, I mean, we understand the consequences, but, I, okay, it's like, that we've been living with them for 17 years, you know? I feel as though if they, they enforce their rules, you know, they enforce what's good and bad, and then, you know, you come to a point where it's up to you to decide. I mean, they know it's wrong. You know it's wrong, but until, they, until you find out for yourself. Not saying that you're going to go out and get pregnant. It's just like certain things that your parents should, you know, have enough trust in you that you wouldn't do that. Okay. Because if not, if, if you're not going to do it with their permission, then, you know, that gives you even more reason to want to go and do it. Because so you don't have to I think all you all are saying, that as you all get older, from 13 to 17, you want to renegotiate uh, the, the, the room, and you want more and more rope, yeah. right? Okay, you want a regular negotiation, because all you are saying, when I go to college, I'm totally free, and so you want a gradual uh, movement to that but, point. But when okay? you go to college, you, you're free to a certain extent, but you're always going to call home and say, Mom, I need yeah. this, Mom, I need yeah. that, can you please help me? But we're, we're just saying that we need, you know, more responsibilities laid on us so that we can understand what they went through or what they did not go through and maybe that we can get a better perspective on ourselves. Okay, and I agree. Right quick before time runs out, when I went to Illinois State, there were a thousand black students that went there with me. Four years later, only 254 graduated. At, a, at college, in a dormitory, by themselves, no parents. How come only this uh, few graduated and the rest of them didn't? It wasn't ability. The other group, the other 746, stayed in the cafeteria, stayed in the dormitory's room, uh, kept shooting the breeze, playing. They lack discipline. And so some of us say we want responsibility, but really can't handle it. We have to work on that. But let's go on before time runs out. I want to look at the com competition of peer esteem and that self-esteem. The only way to win against peer esteem is to have self-esteem. In other words, I believe you make silly mistakes when you have nothing to lose. Why not get high? Why not get pregnant? Why not drop out of school? You have nothing to lose. What is it that you value so much you would not want to lose it? Is it a belief in God? Is it unconditional love from your parents? Is it high expectations from teachers? Is it feeling good about your race? Is it knowing where your talents are? Is it knowing you're going to college? That you have a career down the road? I have studied to say that little girls do not get pregnant when they know they're going to college. See, the real issue is you have to be able to tell your friends no. But you can't tell your friends no if you are not strong. 
And I believe one way to be strong is to improve your self-esteem and also to have goals. You see, when you have goals in your life, when you know you want to be an engineer, you don't cut class. When you know you want to be a doctor, you don't get pregnant at 16 or 17 years of age. I want you to begin to ask yourself two questions. One, why are you here? I don't mean today. Why are you here in life? First one. And the second one, what is it that you want so much? You live for it, you die for it, you dream about it, you think about it. All your waking moments are on it. If you can't answer those two questions quickly throughout your entire life, you're liable to succumb to peer pressure. Why are you here and what do you want more than anything else? See, when you really want to be a doctor, you can tell your friends no. Maybe the real issue is our self-esteem is not as strong as we think it is. And secondly, we are unclear on what our goals are. But beyond the issue of students, beyond the issue of parents, I want to also move now to the teachers. I want to talk about cooperative learning. Here's a typical situation in a classroom. You have 30 students in a classroom, and many teachers grade on the curve. Now, one student scored a 98. The next highest student scored a 79. Everyone else was below them. Now, young people, if you had a situation like this, where there were stu 30 students in a class, and one person scored a 98, and the next highest grade was 79, of course, they got the A, this one probably got a B, and everybody else got C's and F's. How would you all feel about this student? Be mad. Okay? Well, that's what happens when you have I more important than we. But in cooperative learning, rather than an individual grade, we're going to have a team grade. We're going to have the Lakers. We're going to have the Bengals. We're going to have the Shante. We're going to have six teams of five players. And so therefore, the one that scored a 98 and the one that scored a 39 are going to be on the same team. Now, in this situation, rather than being mad at each other, the one that got the low grade is going to be encouraging him to get even the better grade. And this one is going to be encouraging this one to get a better grade. We're now going to study together. We're not going to reinforce each other. In cooperative learning, if you had a group of five students, you would give them five different assignments. And they then would have to work with each other to teach each other what was learned. What we found out is sometimes the students can present the idea better to each other than even the teachers can. They can break down Marcus Garvey or an algebraic equation sometimes better than the students can or better than the teachers can. And so cooperative learning works. And what else I like about this is in cooperative learning, you no longer have teachers saying, sit down, be quiet, get back to work. Because in this situation, they're working together. And I think this is a better way to deal with peer pressure. We may never be able to reduce the impact of peer pressure. But what we can do is infiltrate the peer group and get them to work with each other to reinforce academic achievement. If we can do that, then maybe we can turn some of this around. Cooperative learning works, and we've got to find ways to look at this. Some other ideas with regards to peer pressure is the community. And before I do that, one other quick point on the classroom, on schools. In your schools, is more glory given to the athlete or to the scholar? More trophies, awards given to the athlete or the scholar? More pep rallies to the scholar or the athlete? We have to work on that. We want more schools giving pep rallies and trophies and medals to the scholars. I can understand the NBA giving more glory to the athlete, but not schools. I also want schools to quit dealing with tracking, where you have the advanced placement, the honor classes, the regular classes. We want all students working together, because when they work together, they can reinforce each other. See, in a class where one child got 100 and another child got 40, there should be no happiness here. The one that got 100 should be helping the other child to receive 40. What Jesus said, when you do the least of these, you also do unto me. See, the Asians study together. Black folks need to study together. We always study by ourselves. We need to start studying together and reinforce each other. And then lastly, for the community. In the black community, are there more programs that work with black youth in sports and in music, or are there more programs helping black youth in math and in science and in language arts? Which one? Sports and music. So you see, adults, we are giving our youth negative messages. Not only do schools give more glory to sports and music, but so does the community. There are all kinds of programs in Cincinnati, LA, Baltimore, Detroit to reinforce sports and music. 
But where are the academic programs for math and science and language arts? NAACP has one. It's called AXA. Upper Bound's another very good one. We need more programs that reinforce academic achievement. And you know what's interesting? The rumor is we have a shortage of black men. There's not a shortage of black men to be Little League baseball coaches, to be basketball coaches, but where are the black men in math and in science and in language arts? I don't believe it's our young people's fault. I believe the reason why we have figures like this, remember I gave this figure in terms of the MBA and engineers, I believe it's because the black community reinforces this. We have a lot more programs in sports and music than we do in math and science. And we have to begin to work on these kinds of issues. Are there any questions or closing comments from the group with regards to how we can monitor peer pressure? We've tried to first of all look at its impact and then look at what students can do, what parents can do, what teachers can do, and we also want more community activists to design programs in math and science and language arts. Any closing comments from the group? Yes. You made a statement earlier that if you're strong, you could, you know, turn the pressure away if you're positive about yourself. And I believe that it all starts, you know, when you're young at home with the parental relationship. And as you, as you all grow, you know, with your parents and stuff, and you have trust, and you do good in school, your parents monitor you or whatever, that it'll grow and you'll be more confident in yourself. And so when that pressure comes, you'll be able to turn it away. You know, and, or maybe so you recommend parents to be kind of out very early. Yeah. And you want more programs in the classroom and the community that start working with peer pressure at a very early age. Yeah. Okay. Any other clothing from anyone? Both adults and young people. I think that we could begin by looking at ourselves because we individually are part of that peer group that we're talking about. And if we decide among ourselves that we're going to elevate some things, for example, like engineering and math, etc., then we become a peer group and then we can dictate. Right. And closing, remember, to be smart is to be black. Being black means black excellence. Now remember at the beginning, we had a negative encounter between peer pressure. Now let's look at a positive interaction between a brother and a sister that handle peer pressure very well. Quayley, we need to take this chemistry test seriously. Yeah, you're right, Kevin. Why don't you take three chapters and I'll take the other three and we'll just study together. Sounds good to me.